After playing nearly three hours of Immortals Phoenix Rising, I came away with a great idea of what this game is all about. Immortals blew me away in terms of what I expected, in a good way. After Ubisoft Forward, I'm sure a lot of you have questions. Why did they change the name from Gods and Monsters? Is this just Ubisoft's version of Breath of the Wild? Why does it somehow also look like Assassin's Creed Odyssey? I'm going to answer all of those questions and more as I share my honest opinions on the game. We'll dive deep into the story, exploration, combat, puzzling, RPG mechanics, pretty much everything I experienced with the demo. Before we get started, if you want to hear my less scripted impressions of Immortals, check out my weekly podcast, Preloaded. We cover new releases, previews, and exclusive hands-on details on games like this. Catch new episodes every Monday free here on my YouTube channel and wherever you listen to podcasts. Back to the video. First, I think it's fair to ask and answer the question, what is Immortals Phoenix Rising? When Ubisoft first revealed Gods and Monsters, it felt more like an idea than a fully realized game. Now, just a couple months ahead of launch, Immortals feels clear in its purpose and identity. It's an open-world action-adventure with light RPG elements. Don't be fooled into thinking this is an RPG. I know we slap that term on a lot of games these days, but trust me when I say that Immortals just doesn't fit that label. There's no dialogue choice, you're not walking up to NPCs and having conversations, you're not min-maxing stats and skills for an optimal build, you're not picking up loot from every single enemy or managing inventory space. There's no leveling or experience bar or any grinding that I could find. It shares a lot of familiar elements with RPGs, but approaches them through the lens of an action-adventure game. Immortals leans into its combat, puzzling, platforming, and exploration. But it still offers those light RPG elements that people expect, like choosing a playstyle, visual customization, and some crafting. Once I recognized what Immortals was going for, I fell in love with what this game has to offer. And I really can't wait to see what else it has in store. So why'd they change the name? Ubisoft was very upfront about this, even going so far as to mention it in the title sequence. Presents the video game formerly known as Gods and Monsters. Now, I don't know if that's just for the demo, but it did make me laugh. A developer from the studio explained that Immortals Phoenix Rising better fit the vision they had for this game. It's clear that Immortals Phoenix Rising does not roll off the tongue like Gods and Monsters, but what it does tell me is that Ubisoft plans to turn this series into a franchise. This game feels like an origin story about Phoenix, her journey to reach Olympus, and her quest to defeat Typhon, the destroyer of gods. After playing the game, the title fits the new direction, but I understand why people are still turned off by this change. If you played Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Immortals feels familiar in a lot of ways. It's developed by the same team at Ubisoft Quebec. From what I can tell, it runs on a modified version of the same engine, so you'll see some service level similarities. For example, the map looks similar to Odyssey. It's very colorful, there's lots of icons, but I found this to be less intimidating. The inventory screen is familiar. You've got gear slots to swap out weapons and armor. The way abilities are displayed in the bottom right corner is the same. Scouting for locations feels like controlling Icaros, and even the control scheme is pretty much identical. I could go on all day long with surface level comparisons. But in the end, I found that this game feels much more like The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. You're going to hear me compare Immortals Phoenix Rising to Breath of the Wild a lot in this video. Because it's a fair comparison, Immortals takes a lot of notes from Breath of the Wild, but it never feels egregious or annoyingly similar to me. It does a lot to carve out a unique identity that I think you'll pick up on as I share more about the game. But perhaps most importantly of all, Immortals feels like the game Ubisoft Quebec wanted to make when they made Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Like everything that fell out of place in that game feels right at home here. It's light, it's jokey, it plays with Greek mythology in a fantastical and magical way. It truly does feel like all the dominoes fell into place, and I'm really happy that Ubisoft Quebec was given the opportunity to make the game they wanted to make, because this works. The way Immortals looks is unmistakably inspired by Breath of the Wild. The art direction is cartoony, you can tell they were going for a very specific look. This style certainly is not for everyone, some people will be turned off by how the game looks. 
But like Breath of the Wild, I found it to be compelling. The Golden Isle is full of bright colors, the character models are unique and fit within the mythology theme, and the animations are bouncy and magical. Visually, this game is just bursting at the seams with personality. The world design is also very Breath of the Wild. It features a lot of verticality, huge vistas, and vast overlooks where you can see across the entire map. Phoenix can glide around the world and visit the incredible amount of landmarks dotted across the horizon. I genuinely cannot wait to explore King's Peak to the north, or the Parthenon to the west, really every part of this island. Here's what we know about the story. At the very beginning, Prometheus tells us that Phoenix's goal is to reach Olympus and defeat Typhon, the God Destroyer. He's been freed from Tartarus and is now trying to destroy all of the gods. But before Phoenix can do that, she has to go into the Forge Lands to restore the essence of Hephaestus. I was given the option here to ignite the furnaces or reactivate the Forge's vents. Picking one or the other led me to restoring power to his workshop, but I didn't realize that at the time there was actually a choice to be made there. I could have picked one or the other, so I'm curious how different the objectives would have turned out. Story missions incorporate a blend of everything you're doing in Immortals. There's some puzzling, some platforming, and some combat. Once the workshop is powered, Typhon challenges Phoenix directly and unleashes his rage. This is a really cool mechanic that I think will be persistent throughout the game. Anytime you defeat a lot of enemies, complete myth challenges, or close vaults of Tartarus, Typhon launches meteors at Phoenix and summons wraiths to hunt you down. These are corrupted forms of fallen Greek heroes. In order to stop his rage and return the world to a normal state, you have to defeat the wraith. In my demo, I faced the Wraith of Odysseus, which had the unique power to teleport around and surprise attack me from all directions. It felt challenging, and I'm excited to see what all of the other Wraiths will do. We don't really know what's next for the story specifically, but I assume we'll face similar challenges in each region of the game, leading up to Typhon at the end. Our protagonist, Phoenix, is mostly a mystery right now. We know that she's a mortal who was imbued with powers from the gods. I'm curious to know if we'll see Phoenix get her powers, or if she'll just have them from the start. Before we move on, I want to talk about the tone of this game. Because humor is a big part of the storytelling in Immortals. The story is narrated by the gods Prometheus and Zeus. It's like they're watching Phoenix as you play, commenting on what she does. Even she knows they're there. A lot of the dialogue is either self-referential or fourth wall breaking. The characters in this game know that they're in a video game. Here's what they say the first time you dive off of God of the Forge. This mortal has no sense of safety. Jumps right into holes like a rabbit or a tomb. Zeus! No lawsuits here, please! I like this kind of tone. It worked for me. It feels like a breath of fresh air where a lot of games take themselves way too seriously. But I also recognize this will turn some people off. It's definitely not for everyone. But for me, I loved it. Overall, I expect the story to be a reason that I enjoy this game. I don't think it'll be a groundbreaking narrative experience, but I'm sure that dialogue and characters will make me laugh, and that feels like enough. In my demo, I was restricted to the Forge Lands, but the map revealed that there are six other areas to visit, all with their own unique theme and design. If you're wondering just how big the map is, it's honestly hard for me to tell even after playing the game. I don't think you can compare it to an Assassin's Creed game, but it feels like a smaller, more dense version of Breath of the Wild. What I can say is that there is plenty to do in the Forge Lands alone. By the end of my time, I felt like there was still a ton I hadn't done or seen within the area I was restricted to. But I would caution that it doesn't seem like Immortals is an endless game with hundreds of hours of playtime, but that's a plus for me. I started the demo at a location called God of the Forge, which gave me a great perspective of the Forge Lands and its surrounding regions. Just like with Icaros and Odyssey, you can go into a recon mode called Farsight. This lets you hover over glints in the distance, which you can reveal to learn what's at that location and permanently mark on the map. Honestly, I love games that let you use your eyes to scout for locations instead of marking everything on the map by default. It makes exploration feel more natural and rewarding to me, so I appreciated this. You can also set custom pins and chart a course to explore something that just looks interesting even if there's nothing there. I have a feeling I'll be doing that a lot because this world is just gorgeous. Phoenix has a magical mount that you can summon at any time and cover long distances on the ground. Just like Breath of the Wild, you have a stamina bar and it drains when you gallop. 
The horse in the demo had so much stamina that I really never had to worry about it. I was surprised to learn, however, that you can tame wild animals. By crouching and sneaking up slowly, I pressed one button to tame this horse. More than anything, this felt like a collectible activity, but I'm excited to see what kind of crazy mythical creatures we'll be able to tame on full release. If you need to get around quickly, Phoenix can fast travel to any vantage point, point of interest, or vault of Tartarus that you've already explored. And these are some of the best places to launch off and glide with your wings of Daedalus, which allow Phoenix to glide around. And just like the paraglider was for Breath of the Wild, this is a great way to just take in the visuals of this game. Outside of magical wings and mounts, Phoenix can sprint, but the button mapping is so bizarre. Holding down X to sprint on an Xbox controller feels really unnatural. Phoenix can scale walls too, and you guessed it, it feels a lot like Breath of the Wild. And like that game, I found my experience grinding to a halt whenever I had to slowly scale a cliffside. Given Phoenix's godly powers and magical wings, it feels like she should be able to climb much faster than she can. Luckily, there are usually air vents around that let you avoid climbing entirely. There are a ton of items to collect while you're exploring the Golden Isle, different materials, each with a specific purpose. These are all tracked in the pause screen at the top right. This felt overwhelming until I figured out what everything was used for and how to find it. Ambrosia and Zeus's lightning are used to upgrade health and stamina. Golden Amber upgrades potion effects. Yellow shards are used to upgrade the potion pouch and arrow capacity. And then blue, red, and purple shards are used to upgrade weapons and armor. Blue and yellow are the most common shards, while purple is the rarest. We'll talk more about how you find these later in the video. You can also gather ingredients to make potions. Pomegranates for health, blue mushrooms for stamina, Olympian figs for attack, and flower nectar for defense. Potion crafting is handled at specific locations called Cauldrons of Circe. You have to bring these materials to these places in order to craft new potions or refill your supply. I wasn't on board with this. I found it was a little bit weird that I couldn't just craft potions on the spot wherever I wanted. Exploration is so important to the open world genre, and Immortals seems to understand that. The Golden Isle is full of landmarks, interesting activities, and it's genuinely fun to glide around and soak in the gorgeous scenery. I'm going to have such a blast exploring this game. Combat feels light and arcadey, like a hack and slash action RPG but at the same time, it has a level of depth that I think will surprise people. It borrows a lot of mechanics from Odyssey, but they're implemented in a way that feels right for immortals. You build stamina with light attacks and then spend it with godly powers. Heavy attacks and godly powers build stun on enemies, which is tracked via the blue bar beneath their health. When an enemy's stun gauge fills, they're completely incapacitated and all attacks become critical strikes. From what I could tell, this is the best way to take down large enemies. Focus on building their stun gauge, then lay down as much damage as possible to finish them off. There's a regular parry, which deflects enemy attacks, but there's also a perfect parry. If you get the timing just right, it refills stamina, deals massive stun, and reflects projectiles. Same goes for the dodge, there's a perfect dodge that slows down time. Put all of these together and you've got some really engaging combat. After a couple of hours, I still felt like I was learning how to string everything together with my godly powers. Speaking of, Phoenix has access to six godly powers, and they're tracked in the bottom right corner. Again, these cost stamina to use, so you can't just spam these abilities. Athena's dash propels you forward, damaging and stunning every enemy that she hits. Heracles' strength lets Phoenix pick up objects like rocks and throw them. This one is used a lot for puzzles, but one of the upgrades lets you pull yourself towards enemies, which was super helpful in combat. Ares' Wrath damages and stuns enemies in an area, launching them upwards for air combos. Phosphor's Attack sends your Phoenix in to deal damage and stun from a distance. One of the upgrades makes you completely invisible when crouched, allowing you to sneak past enemies and set up a stealth attack. Apollo's Arrows lets you control shots mid-flight, just like an Odyssey. And then my personal favorite, Hephaestus' Hammer, deals a ton of AoE damage, stuns, and knocks enemies back. Judging from the upgrade menus, this seems like every godly power we will have in the game. And that's okay, because they all felt unique and served a different purpose. 
There's also a combo meter, which, if I'm being honest, I didn't pay too much attention to. As long as you keep landing hits without getting hit, you'll maintain the combo. I didn't realize during the demo, but as long as you keep up the combo, you're going to get bonus damage. The higher the combo meter, the higher the damage. There's also ranged combat with the bow. Rapid fire quick shots deal low damage at a high fire rate, or you can unleash a charge shot by holding the trigger. Most enemies have a headshot weak spot, which deals critical damage. Again, the bow feels like the recent AC games, but the light and floaty style, the way it handles, suits Immortals much better. I was really happy with the enemy variety, even in the Forge Lands alone. You've got your typical Greek mythological creatures, the Cyclops, Harpies, Minotaurs, Cerberus, just to name a few. It feels like we'll fight some version of these enemies across every single zone. And then the Forge Lands has its own set of creatures that feel unique to this area. Large automatons, medium-sized ones with big hammers, and then these smaller guys with shields. Most enemy types have an unparryable attack, meaning that you have to dodge out of the way or you'll get hit. This kept me on my toes because these attacks hit hard. In terms of how hard this game is, the demo only offered easy and normal difficulties, so there were times where I felt combat was a bit too easy. Then again, the automaton boss wasn't a walk in the park and threw some unique mechanics at me that I didn't expect. I also died one time trying to defeat Lieutenant Brontes, a mythical fiend. This giant cyclops throws rocks and was powerful enough to two-shot my phoenix but I was able to down him after a second try. I'm not sure if they're going to show this in Ubisoft Forward, but there is stealth in Immortals. It almost feels like a holdover from Odyssey, like Quebec had the code for stealth already, so they decided to put it in here. Phoenix can crouch down in bushes and tall grass to become invisible. You'll recognize the eye symbol from Odyssey too that shows you whether you're hidden or not. With the Phosphorus Cloak upgrade, crouching anywhere makes you invisible, which makes it very easy to set up a stealth attack. I tried this a few times and just didn't find it very fun compared to the hack and slash combat I was getting outside of stealth. The final element of combat is potions. There are four different types of potions that you could use at any time. Health Potion restores health, Stamina recovers Stamina, Attack gives you a damage boost for 90 seconds, and Defense improves your defenses for 90 seconds. I found myself popping an Attack or Defense Potion every single time I went into a fight, and then using the Health and Stamina as needed. You can also consume pomegranates and blue mushrooms as a way to restore smaller bits of health and stamina. I found myself not using potions as much as I probably should have, considering the ingredients are plentiful. Like I mentioned before, I didn't love how I had to visit the Cauldron of Circe before every single mission to refill my supplies, but I appreciate how central these are to the combat loop. Immortals' ability-driven combat feels fun, fresh, and engaging. I didn't know what to expect outside of Ubisoft Quebec's previous experience, and I was happy to find that they used the flashy magical combat of Odyssey for this game. Say what you will about how that fit into an Assassin's Creed, but it feels appropriate here. It fits everything else this game is trying to be. You might be surprised by how much puzzling and platforming you'll be doing in Immortals Phoenix Rising. It felt like a 50-50 split between combat and puzzle platforming. Similar to the underground shrines of Hyrule, Immortals has dungeon activities called Vaults of Tartarus. When Typhon escaped the underworld, he left portals open for Phoenix to explore. These are scattered across the world, and each one asks you to complete a series of objectives for a reward. Just like shrines, these offer a mix of platforming, puzzling, and combat. At the end, you're rewarded with Zeus's Lightning, which is used to upgrade your max stamina. Most of the upgrade systems were locked in the demo, so I didn't get to use these. It's worth noting that these vaults have a couple of secrets off the beaten path. For example, the first vault I did had an epic chest that was behind this gate, and I had to unlock it via a switch that I hit with my arrow. The majority of open world activities in Immortals are called Myth Challenges. These offer a variety of objectives, each one focused on a specific skill set. But the reward is the same, which is coins of Charon, which are used to upgrade skills and godly powers. Again, the upgrade systems were locked in the demo, so I couldn't actually use these coins. But I did notice that harder activities rewarded more coins. Here is every single myth challenge in the demo and how it works. 
Frescoes are sliding puzzles where you physically push blocks into place to form a complete picture. The one I did required me to hit a switch with my arrow in order to unlock the pieces before I could continue. Navigation challenges were the easiest. These ask you to make it to the finish line before the timer runs out. The one I found was a gliding challenge where I navigated past the lasers using a series of vents to stay in the air. Odysseus challenges rely on your reflexes. Using the Apollo's arrow ability, you guide shots through rings in order to light a brazier. Sometimes you'll have to clear some corruption so the path isn't blocked. I actually had trouble locating the next rings on one of these puzzles, but once I figured it out, these were a cinch. Constellations are physics puzzles, where you use Heracles' strength to pick up magical orbs and place them in the correct pattern. This was the longest myth challenge, but it rewarded the most coins of the ones that I did find. The Big Liar myth challenge is exactly what it sounds like. It's a huge magical harp. It's a meta puzzle that requires you to complete the smaller liars first. These are also scattered around the map, and the one I did tasked me with lighting a series of brazers with arrows before a timer ran out. Then I had to memorize the melody and return back to the big lyre to play it. I shot the big lyre in the same pattern to unlock my reward. Judging from the shimmering glow around the big lyre, it seems like there are two other small ones in this zone to complete the forge lands. I definitely expect to find one of these meta puzzles per zone. Those are all of the myth challenges, and I found the variety really nice. Like, these all feel different, distinct enough, and have their own kind of challenge that you can expect every single time you run across them. Outside of myth challenges, there's a section called collectibles. I found these to be the least engaging, but they're quick, painless, and dole out solid rewards. Normal chests are found during quests and at the end of some myth challenges. These contain blue and yellow shards along with potion ingredients. Guarded chests require you to defeat a group of enemies at their location. These offer red shards in addition to the more common ones. Epic chests are the highest tier. These require the most challenge and reward you with purple shards, which is the highest tier upgrade material. It's worth noting that I found golden amber and potions in epic chests, so you get pretty much everything from these. Night chests are completely unique. These only appear at night, but you can still go to their location during the day. When I did, I used the rest button in my demo to fast forward to nighttime. These are well guarded and reward you with tons of every single type of material. I also found a midnight fragment in mine. I have no idea what that's used for, but I can't wait to find out. I think I forgot to mention this earlier, but this is one of those activities that will incur Typhon's rage. After I opened the night chest, he spawned the Wraith of Odysseus, which was pretty easy for me to take down, but presented a cool fight with unique mechanics. The final collectible is Ambrosia, which is randomly placed around the map on areas that are harder to reach. Not much more to say about that other than I couldn't use them because again, I couldn't upgrade my health. Puzzle platforming is, in my opinion, one of the most fun and most underrated types of gameplay out there. I loved what Immortals has to offer in this respect, and I'm hopeful that the variety holds up after a few dozen hours. I also appreciated how it didn't hold my hand. The game is relying on your knowledge of the mechanics that you've learned over a period of time of playing, and I had to think to solve some of this stuff. I even asked my demoist one time to give me hints so I wasn't wasting any recording time. When it comes to RPG elements, there is no experience bar or level in this game. There's no grinding to hit a level requirement to progress. What kind of damage you deal depends solely on your gear, what perks your gear has, and how much you've upgraded it. How many skills you have and what kind of godly powers upgrades that you have depends on the coins of Charon that you've collected and how you've spent them. This was a surprise to me. It was so nice to not see progression tied to this magical stat, even in a game where they could have easily done that. Like a lot of open world games out there, you are finding and collecting new gear. Completing certain missions and opening chests will reward you with new weapons and armor pieces. But the difference between gear boils down to how they look and what their two perks have to offer. Phoenix has a sword slot for light attacks and an axe slot for heavies. From what I could tell, you can't swap the sword for a mace or a flail or the axe for a spear or another heavy weapon. So you're not going to get a different move set depending on which weapons you have equipped. You are stuck with what you have. Instead, the difference is the skin and the perks. 
This sort of light customization feels appropriate to me for the kind of game Immortals is trying to be. You can customize your playstyle to a degree, but it's not on the level of other games or any RPG for that matter. Your experience won't be vastly different than mine. If it wasn't clear by now, this is not a game with a ton of stat values that require min-maxing or optimizing for a build. I'm not 100% sure on this, but I believe that all pieces of gear start at the same base numbers, meaning that one weapon won't be inherently better than another in terms of raw damage. The difference there comes from which perks they offer and what rank that you've upgraded them to. Speaking of upgrades, you can upgrade your armor and weapons using resources found out in the world. Those are the colored shards. Even though I wasn't able to do any of that in the demo, we can still see some of those upgrades. For the Sword of Achilles, at rank 4, we'd unlock Health Refill on Perfect Dodge. I'm assuming that these little nodes beneath each symbol for gear represents the ranks for each item, and each rank will increase the damage value on those weapons and defense on armor. I hope I didn't undersell the way that gear works in this game earlier. There's a lot to play around with when you look at everything that's going on. Some of these perks do make a big difference in combat. And I had no complaints. I love the approach that they took with weapon and combat design here. Since we're talking about RPG elements, we need to talk about skills and abilities. The abilities tab is divided into skills on the left and godly powers on the right. On the skill side, there are 13 base abilities, but 34 total unlocks. Some of them are combat related, such as sword combos and the ability to use a bow. Others are extremely basic and self-explanatory, like being able to double jump or just being able to sprint. Since I had all of the basic skills unlocked, I'm interested to know if we'll have to unlock very basic things like swimming or climbing. On the right side is godly powers, and it's pretty much the same story here. I couldn't see what the other upgrades were, but the things that you were unlocking were small modifications to the base godly abilities. Like, this isn't changing fundamentally how these things work, it's just adding a little more functionality. While I couldn't unlock these upgrades, I couldn't even hover over this stuff and see what it was, we do know how we'll be upgrading. Again, that's by completing myth challenges and using our coins of Charon. But to be clear, there's no picking and choosing for a specific build. There's no paths to take. The progression here is very linear, like most action adventure games and unlike most RPGs. The one part of upgrading that I could access was potion upgrades, and you do these once again via the Cauldrons of Circe. Using Golden Amber, which you can find in epic chests and by chopping down glowing tree stumps, you can unlock and upgrade the effects for each potion. In my demo, I chose to upgrade my stamina potion to refill more chunks per use. Like skills and abilities, potion upgrades are linear. You're just getting better and better instead of choosing one path over another. Going in, I was worried that Immortals might try to be an RPG, and I was so relieved when I found that it doesn't. It plays around with some of these ideas, like gear slots and perk effects, but it doesn't ever dive so deep headfirst as to confuse you about what kind of game you're playing. Most of the time, you're in the action, you're exploring, you're fighting, you're solving puzzles. This is not an endless experience with grinding and unnecessary leveling. There's progression, but it's so light that I'm not constantly worrying about it. I loved that Immortals is not an RPG. Immortals Phoenix Rising is a breath of fresh air in the open world genre. It's not trying to be an RPG. It's not forcing survival elements like hunger, sleep, or weapon decay. It's fun, it's light, it's just a really good time. Best of all, it represents what I think is Ubisoft Quebec at its best, at its finest. This is the game this studio is uniquely positioned to make. From the time I spent with the game, they've done it. They've made the game that they wanted to make, and I'm so happy for them. Now, I don't know if this is going to appeal to the larger casual crowd. I don't know if it'll grow to be as big as Watch Dogs or Assassin's Creed. But I expect this to be a solid new IP for Ubisoft for many years to come, and I genuinely cannot wait to play it in December. That is, if I even have time, because honestly, like Valhalla, Cyberpunk, everything, the new consoles, everything is coming out at the same time. So. We'll see. If we get new information about Immortals from Ubisoft Forward, you can expect a video along with the usual Valhalla content and even some cyberpunk coming soon on the channel. So make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to receive notifications when those videos go live. Big thanks to my patrons, Bill, Grass, David, Casey, John, Kamal, Spyro, Tom, Jackie, Level42, and Matthew. 
If you didn't know, I have a Patreon where you can support me further in exchange for exclusive updates and behind the scenes content. Check out the link in the description for more information. Thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you next time.